Hello all and welcome to this new episode of Global Voices on Hard Reading TV. I'm your host, Juan Carlos Serp. Last episode, we connect with Poland and have a nice talk with Dr. Roman Piotrowski about the Roman 1 trial, the first randomized clinical trial approaching cardioneuroblation. In this opportunity, we're going to explore more now approaching details of the cardioneuroblation technique. And for that, today I have with me, the, from Sao Paulo, Brazil, the father of the cardioneuroblation, Professor Jose Carlos Pachon. Dr. Pachon, welcome to Heart Reading TV. Thank you very much, dear friend Zerpa. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a good opportunity to talk about cardioneuroblation. I would like to thank also Jordan by his assistance in this uh, activity. Thank you very much to HRS for this great opportunity to spread the science. We are going to talk about, about the cardioneuroblation. Welcome aboard. Let's start. I know the cardioneuroblation is a relative new procedure, but it has been some years developing putting together evidence and data. Please tell us about the beginnings of the technique. How was it idealized? How difficult was to finally achieve a publication and how did it evolve during all these years? Okay, the cardioneuroblation was created when we uh, were uh, trying to to understand the atrial fibrillation in normal heart, in normal people. Um, in that time, we developed uh, uh, an spectrometer to study the atrial potentials by using the spectral analysis online during ablations. So uh, basically on the spectral analysis, we found that the atrial myocardium in normal heart is composed of two different, two different strands. The, the, the first one is uh, the compact myocardium that is composed with cells very well connected, electrically very well connected. And the second one is composed of cells poor connected, loose cells. The name of this myocardium is fibrillar myocardium. And we name the, this, the clusters of the fibrillar myocardium that may be found throughout the atrial wall. Uh, we name it the uh, atrial fibrillation nest. Uh, the name is based by the fact that the atrial fibrillation nest is related to the uh, origin of the atrial fibrillation in normal heart. Uh, in a few in a short time, we uh, observed that the ablation of the atrial fibrillation nest caused a, 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 a good result, a complete electrical stability of the atrial wall. And also, the, another, another result that is very important is the vagal denervation of the atrial wall. So we realized that atrial fibrillation nest is related to the insertion of the innervation, mainly the vagal innervation in the atrial wall. We found a lot of atrial fibrillation nest in the insertion of the pulmonary veins, in the insertion of the innervation, and mainly over the areas related it that uh, mainly overlapping the ganglionated plexi. But it's possible to find atrial fibrillation nest and fibrillar myocardium throughout the left and right atrium, and mainly in the interatrial septum. Here, the results of the ablation of the atrial fibrillation nest, there is an important uh, electrical instability of the atrial wall. In this case, we are stimulating the atrium up to 300 beats per minute. And uh, in this case, there is no inducity. There is no atrial fibrillation induction. This is an example of a patient that had 
atrial fibrillation, and after the ablation of the EFNES, there is no more possible to reinduce the atrial fibrillation. And the second result is the uh, denervation. Here we can see uh, 83 patients that were studied before the uh, ablation of the AFNS. There is, in this case, a mean of 163 milliseconds of SDNN. And after two years of ablation of atrial fibrillation S, we may observe that the SDNN went down to 78 milliseconds. So we uh, found that ablation of AFNS causes an uh, important uh, denervation. Basically, on these findings, we decided to create the procedure cardioneuroablation that we patented in the United States. The aim uh, was to get significant long-lasting vagal response attenuation, and we created the name cardioneuroablation in order to short the procedure in the term CNA. That's excellent. That's very interesting because it's a lot of history and a lot of work in, in this process of the growing the cardinal ablation. But now referring to who is the ideal patient, when we should consider to indicate the cardinal ablation, in which patient, in which patient does work and in which, in who it does not work. Uh, there is a, an issue that you would ask at me before about the first publication. The first publication of cardioneuroblation uh, was possible in, in 2000, uh, 2004 and 2005. And in that time, it was difficult to, to have the acceptance of the publication because in that time there was uh, a, 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 a very... Uh, a, there is a lot of congresses and publications about atrial fibrillation ablation and uh, resynchronization therapy. And uh, I see this. So in that time, it, it was very difficult to get space to publicate the cardio neuroblation. And same, several reviewers um, in that time, were afraid about the publication because they found no literature about the procedure, obviously because it was a first time of publication of a new procedure. And about the indications of the cardioneuroblation, uh, it's important to see the first paper that was published in 2005 in that time, we found very interesting results, very good results for treating five patients with neurocardiogenic syncope, in this case, cardioinhibitory neurocardiogenic syncope. In seven cases, with functional high degree AV block. In 13 patients, presenting sinus node dysfunction. And even in nine patients, presenting atrial fibrillation. This are the main indications, neurocardiogenic syncope, functional high degree AV block, sinus nerve dysfunction, and atrial fibrillation. However, we, we may see here the extended indications in reflex bradyarrhythmias and functional non-reflex bradyarrhythmias. The main issue is to take into account that it is necessary to select patients with symptoms clinically refractory, absence of significant cardiopathy, and good response to atropine. Uh, it is interesting that Dr. Yao from China have been using the uh, cardioneuroblation for treating vasodepressor, vasovagal syncope. I have no experience with this indication. However, his group is showing good results. In our uh, initial uh, study, we used the cardioneuroblation only for cardioinhibitory vasovagal syncope. And it's important to note that uh, also the cardioneuroblation may be used for, uh, for cases presenting 
é, carótide sinus syndrome. Uh, you are uh, doing a very interesting study in our group, showing that the cardioneuroblation may be useful in very well selected cases in patients presented that we named the functional carotid sinus syndrome, that are patients presenting carotid sinus syndrome without compromising, without commitment of the conduction system, with preserved the conduction system. So in all of these cases, the, um, the cardioneuroblation may be very useful in treating these patients without pacemaker implantation. Excellent. That's great. Great to know that we have all these options to treat our patients that sometimes is difficult to manage. But let's get into it. Let's get into the procedure. Let's talk about endpoints. How can we measure intraoperatory results? What is the value of the heart rate increase and AV conduction intervals during the procedure? High frequency stimulation or extracardiac vagal stimulation? And when should we use atropine? Let's talk something about the senior endpoint and cardioneuroblation control of the procedure. Uh, the, at the beginning, uh, the only way to control the procedure was to observe the sinus rate increasing um, progressively as the vagal effect was eliminated. And the also, the increase of the Venkabas point, showing that the vagal effect over the AV node uh, was eliminated or reduced. And the sinus node recovery time, uh, reduction of the sinus node recovery time was also very interesting. And at the end, we used at the beginning the atropine response abolishment. All of this parameters may be useful to show us that the procedure, the cardioneuroblation, is getting a denervation. However, this, in our opinion, these parameters are not enough. In order to have a better control of the procedure, we develop uh, the extracardia vagal stimulation that is easily obtained during the procedure during the ablation, during the cardioneuroablation. It is obtained by advancing a catheter inside of the superior vena cava and in the internal jugular vein. The best place to get vagal stimulation is near to the uh, jugular foramen. However, it's possible to stimulate the vagus along of the uh, internal jugular vein, even near the uh, sternum in the in manubrium of the sternum. Uh, in this case, it's possible to stimulate the vagus without direct contact of the vagus by using uh, a special stimulus of 15 microseconds, uh, 50 microseconds, 50 hertz, and one volt per kilogram up to 70 volts. Uh, in, this is one case, uh, one ablation in our routine that uh, we was performing. And in this case, Dr. Zerpa helped us with the ultrasound guidance of the catheter inside of the internal jugular vein. Here we can see the catheter and here the vagus nerve. It is uh, clear that there is a closer relation between the catheter and the vagus nerve. It is very important to get the best vagal stimulation. And it is easy to get by using the ultrasound control. In this case, the stimulation was performed in the whole procedure in the median of the uh, neck uh, uh, level. So it's another way to stimulate it uh, very, very easily. And here we can see an example of the extracardia vagal stimulation. By beginning the stimulation, there is immediate asystole or even AV block or a very important bradycardia. In this case, there is a very long asystole that recovers 
recovers soon after the, uh, the end of the stochastic vagar stimulation. The asystole is caused by release of the acetylcholine, and it ends after the elimination of the acetylcholine by the acetylcholinesterase. It is very important to know the response of the patient before the cardioneuroblation. And after the cardioneuroblation, again, we repeat the extracardiac vagal stimulation in the same place. In this case, it's showing that the vagal effect was completely eliminated. It is, in our experience, the best endpoint for the procedure. We have to, to, to take into account that uh, if you do any medical procedure, it's necessary to have a control. For example, if you treat the hypertension, it's necessary to measure the pressure, the blood pressure before and after the treatment. In this case, it's necessary to measure the vagal effect before and after the procedure. And it is also very important to note that by stimulating the vagus, we typically found an asystole. However, if we repeat the vagal stimulation by doing or during atrial pacing, we, re, we, we observe a complete total, a total AV block. So it's very important at the, the end point of the cardioneuroblation be both the elimination of the sinus arrest and also the elimination of the total AV block doing the extracardiac vagal stimulation during atrial pacing. I think this is the best endpoint because it's possible to treat the sinus arrest and after this, the patient may be symptomatic because total AV block. Well, that's really important because we need to see the effect that we're doing with ablation and measure these results to achieve better results. But this control with ECVS may increase the, the extent of the ablation. Okay, it is a good, a, a good question. The cardioneuroablation extension, when to finish the procedure, uh, I think, the uh, the the cardio uh, the extracardiac vagal stimulation even may reduce the extension of the ablation because during the cardioneuroablation we use it to um, to do to perform the extracardiac stimulation progressively step by step and we. Uh, finish the procedure soon after the elimination of the vagal response, of the vagal effect. So, in our opinion, the best procedure is the, the safest, the minimum, and the most effective for the patient. So, the most important is not to do wide or short ablation. It's necessary to do the best procedure, the minimal ablation that is able to eliminate completely the vagal effect. Why it is important to eliminate the vagal effect, effect in the index procedure? Because after the cardioneuroablation, there is a natural reinnervation that may uh, cause uh, recovery of the uh, the 40 to 90% uh, of the innervation. So it's important to have a complete vagal uh, uh, denervation in order to have a very good result, even in the long term. Well, that's great. But now let's talk about safety and outcomes. Uh, that's something that concerns all the EP community. We all know this is not a new procedure. Uh, you have shown long-term experience in cardinal ablation, but we want to know, is it safe? Considering that reduction of the vagal action could increase the risk of sudden death in this kind of patient? 
it is a, a, a good a good uh, question because uh, during during the cardioneuroblation there is a reduction of the heart rate variability there is a reduction of the SD and N so uh, several uh, investigators and cardiologists may be afraid of this reduction of the vagal effect. Let's talk something about this. In, in 1980, there was published this study by Nolan and Coase showing that the reduction of the, uh, the showing that the uh, reduced heart rate variability in patients suffering from uh, heart failure mainly after uh, myocardial infarction, this group of patients presented a, a high rate of mortality. So as reduced uh, SDNN is, more mortality uh, it was observed. So it is very uh, delicate to do a procedure that reduces the heart rate variability. We, we can see in this procedure that the mortality of the patients presenting less than 50 milliseconds of the SDNN was uh, the double uh, in patients uh, presenting 50 to 100 milliseconds. So this uh, condition is very delicate. They observed that a reduction in SDNN identifies patients at high risk of death. At the end of cardioneuroblation, we found patients with uh, low heart rate variability. However, in this condition, it is uh, uh, the, 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 the reduction of the SDNN in the group uh, published by Nolan and Coles is a secondary SDNN reduction due to cardiopathy. It is very important. Let's see this publication that we performed in circulation uh, showing the study by two years, by followed by two years of 83 patients. And we observed the, the heart rate variability in these patients. This patient, this, the whole group had no mortality and no syncope during the follow-up. And we observed that at the end of the follow-up, there was an important reduction of the uh, vagal innervation, even the SDNN, an important reduction of the SDNN, and also an important reduction of the sympathetic tone even in the temporal analysis and also in the spectral analysis. So we observed that after cardioneurobration, there is reduction of the autonomic innervation of the heart, the parasympathetic and also the sympathetic innervation. It is very important because after the um, myocardial infarction, there is a reduction of the parasympathetic tone and increase of the sympathetic tone. In this case, we have a high risk group of patients. However, after the cardioneuroblation, we found reduction of the parasympathetic tone, but also reduction of the sympathetic tone. In this case, we are protected. We have a group of patients very well protected because of the reduction of the sympathetic tone. So in our experience, there is no risk in, in, in the reduction of the heart rate variability caused by the cardioneuroblation. But let's see something about the proarrhythmia. In this group of patients during two years of follow-up studied by sequential Holter studies, we found that all the, the uh, premature ventricular beats, coupled premature ventricular beats, ventricular tachycardias, premature atrial uh, uh, beats, and 
couple de prematuri atrial bits and supraventricular tachycardia were reduced, were statistically importantly reduced. And even, obviously, the bradyarrhythmias in this group were reduced or eliminated. So in our long-term uh, experience uh, following patients with cardioneuroblation, we found no proarrhythmia in this group. It is also important to, to, to remember that during the ablation of the atrial fibrillation S and the ganglionated plexized areas, it's important to remember that many times it's necessary to apply high amount of energy in order to get ablation of the ganglionated plexized. It's necessary to take care about the possibility of thermal injury of the esophagus and in our service, we use the diversion of the esophagus in order to ablate without risk of thermal damage of the esophagus. I understand. It's more like sympathetic and parasympathetic modulation. But what are the most common side effects? There's something we should be careful about? Uh, in our uh, in our group of patients, we have a, a high number of patients treated since the 90s. We have been observing that uh, eventually there, there are patients presenting sinus tachycardia that may be controlled uh, clinically by using uh, uh, low doses of beta blockers and even um, uh, physical activity. So there is no important side effect. However, the risk of the cardioneuroblation and the complications uh, are similar to the atrial fibrillation ablation. We have to take care with the procedures in order to avoid uh, bleeding and the, the mainly, obviously, uh, risk of death during the procedure as similar that we do during the atrial fibrillation ablation. We just learned about which patients should we treat? And there is a good evidence about vasovagal syncope, functional bradycardia, and functional AV block. Is there a role of the ablation in atrial fibrillation or other situations? Yes. The ablation for atrial fibrillation ablation, it is a very important issue. We have uh, nowadays uh, a great experience by using the cardioneuroablation for uh, uh, during uh, as an adjunct procedure during atrial fibrillation ablation. Let's see an extracardiac vagal stimulation in a patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation after the pose induced by the vagus. In this case, there is an spontaneous atrial fibrillation uh, induced after the first sinus. A bit after the pose. And the atrial fibrillation disappeared uh, several seconds after the induction, after the spontaneous induction, and the, the atrial fibrillation uh, the, uh, spontaneously uh, recovers, disappears after uh, uh, several seconds. It shows that the vagus is uh, typically causes electrical instability of the atrial wall. We have been showing, we have been um, uh, uh, observing this uh, repeatedly in the population of patients presenting uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation uh, with normal or with uh, cardiopathy, with normal heart and or with cardiopathy. Let's see this uh, study that we performed in, in our lab. In this case, we are uh, studying a patient before the cardioneuroblation, and we determined in this case the atrial uh, effective refractory period. We can see here the determination of the atrial effective refractory period. After this stimulus, the atrial was, uh, was activated and there was no induced any arrhythmia. And if we repeat the same uh, stimulus during vagal stimulation, it's possible induced, uh, induced atrial fibrillation practically in 
any patient, even patients with normal heart. So in this case, it is clear that the an, 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 uh, stimulus during the vagal effect induces atrial fibrillation because the vagus causes dispersion of refractoriness of the atrium. And after the cardioneuroblation in the same patient, we repeat the determination of the atrial effective refractory period. And after the cardioneuroblation, there is no more induction of the atrial fibrillation. So in our lab, in our routine, we typically perform the pulmonary vein isolation. And at the end of the procedure, we studied the elimination of the vagal, uh, of the induction of the atrial fibrillation during the determination of the atrial effective refractory period during vagal stimulation. So in, in, in our experience, it is very important to get the pulmonary vein isolation and also to eliminate the vagal effect. By doing these two procedures, it's possible to see this. After the cardioneuroblation in that patient that presented the atrial fibrillation, again, repeating the uh, extracardia vagal stimulation, there is no more posing and no more induction of atrial fibrillation. In our uh, lab, we have been observing and comparing patients submitted to pulmonary vein isolation for treating paroxysmal and persistent atrial fibrillation. And we compare this group of 55 patients with another group of 72 patients submitted to pulmonary vein isolation plus cardioneuroblation. This blue group was ended with complete elimination of the vagal effect after the ablation. And it was clear that this group submitted to cardio neuroblation plus pulmonary vein isolation had a better follow-up follow up than the patients submitted only to pulmonary vein isolation. The, the, there was, in this case, in the, the blue group, the, it was observed the reduction of the five, five times the number of recurrency in the long phase post atrial fibrillation ablation. So in, uh, in our experience nowadays, it is very important to do the vagal denervation during the atrial fibrillation ablation. I think it improves a lot the results of the atrial fibrillation ablation. Well, this was a great talk, Dr. Pachon. We do know that we have a lot to learn about this hot topic. We're going to make a pause and continue in a second part of this episode. Want to keep updated? Follow How Reading TV on social media and the YouTube channel for the best EP content. Stay tuned, stay safe, wish you all an amazing day. Thank you so much for watching and see you all in the second part of the Cardinal Ovation Technique.